we're at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston speaking with curator Allison DeLima Green about the retrospective exhibition William Kentridge in Praise of Shadows. Thank you, Allison, for joining us today. Thank you, Hollis, and thank you, Richard, for being here and making the trip. It's a thrill to present William Kentridge in Praise of Shadows. Yeah. I wondered if you could begin um, just giving us a general overview of the importance of this particular exhibition. So this exhibition was put together by my colleague Ed Shad for The Broad in Los Angeles. And Eli Broad um, and his wife um, responded early on to Kentridge's work. And so the Broad Foundation owns major, major examples. Mm -hmm. The Museum of Fine Arts is lucky to have several key videos as well. And so the show basically emphasizes the interdisciplinary aspect of his work from his very first beginnings as a printmaker um, to some of his most recent video installations. We have, I think, 83 works of art in the exhibition. Some are multi-panels, though. If you wanted to experience every aspect of the show fully, you would have to spend a full afternoon because we have all of the Johannesburg films. We have his Mozart production, as well as other works uh, that we'll discuss going through the show. Could you talk more about the exhibit title and how it's reflected in the show? Yes, I had an immediate question about the exhibition title myself. William Kentridge in Praise of Shadows. I kept thinking, I know that. And finally, one of our curators of Asian art, Amy Pusher said, well, of course, you know it's Ishiguro's treatise on architecture. And so, of course, I went running to the library to look it up. And Ishiguro, best known um, in the U.S. as a novelist, he wrote The Makioka Sisters, that later became a film, early in his career wrote a passionate defense of traditional architecture in Japan. Mm -hmm. And that with the coming of electricity in the 1920s and 30s, that shadows were being banished. This meant a kind of erasure of history. For Kentridge, as he's made very clear in conversations, he's not making a show about Ishiguro. He was fascinated with shadow play. Years ago, I had a conversation with him about Indonesian shadow puppets, for example, magic lantern shadows, the whole idea of projections, light and shadow. But in Praise of Shadows, resonated profoundly with him, as well as Ishiguro's protest against the erasure of history. Yeah, we could talk more about how that erasure is present in his best known works, I think, are the charcoal drawings and the resulting animations from those. So could you talk a bit more about the process or that, that idea of erasure? Certainly. Um, first of all, Kentridge began his career as a printmaker. That was his early training. His family had come to South Africa um, through his grandfather. Um, his grandfather left the anti-Semitic pogroms of Central Europe um, and brought the family to South Africa in the 1920s. And actually, the figure of Soho Eckstein that you see in some of these drawings um, is somewhat reminiscent of his own grandfather. But trained as a printmaker, when you make a print, you cut into a wood pot or you use acid um, to cut into a plate. So there's an erasure or line is made as an erasure mm -hmm. in printmaking. But there was a turnaround, 180 if you will, um, in the late 1980s when Kentridge discovered that he could apply his enormous skills in draftsmanship as a graphic artist to the charcoal medium, which would also allow him a new approach to filmmaking. Um, basically, he's using stop animation. Um, and as you can see from this drawing here, what he would do is he would draw, erase, draw, erase on the same sheet for a significant sequence in each film. 
I don't know if you've ever worked with charcoal, but it's a very easy, soft medium to work with. It's also a very historic one. The first charcoal drawings are made um, in prehistory when someone took a stick out of a fire and made a mark. I think every artist who works with charcoal thinks about that at some point. But while you can smudge charcoal very easily, once it's on the page, it's almost impossible to remove it altogether. There's always a shadow that remains on the page. Well, in South Africa, which enacted one of the most virulent racist policies in the late 1940s, what we call apartheid, um, that history is never erased, even though the apartheid rule ended in the 1990s. And indeed, Kentridge's parents had worked hard um, to support civil rights of people marginalized by, by apartheid. That sense of there being a stain ever present on the landscape of South Africa remained. And so what you find in the early films, the so-called Johannesburg films, is a long story arch that I think is going to continue in future work. Um, right now there are 11 Johannesburg films. Johannesburg is, and forgive me if I'm telling you what you already know, but it's a gold rush town. You know, they, um, a huge seam of gold was discovered in the 1880s and the town grew up overnight. And there are already colonialist policies and extreme racially discriminatory laws um, that ossified in the apartheid era. In the Johannesburg films, you see again and again this figure, Soho Eckstein, a mining magnate who is both uncovering and covering up the local history. And as the first film is titled Johannesburg, the second most beautiful city in the world, you've got an ongoing narrative of Soho Eckstein, who becomes less and less of a caricature as the series goes on, um, more of a thoughtful character, never a hero, more of an anti-hero. And there are other figures that join the narrative, both African and white South African. And the Museum of Fine Arts has the most recent film in the group, The Great City Deep, uh, which we've shown here before, but now it's really exciting to be able to exhibit in context. Mm -hmm. In the more recent works, it seems that um, he is putting himself more into the work, like where we see him in the studio, for instance. Could you talk a little bit about that work? Yes, I think probably because he was already letting his hand show in the drawings and the Johannesburg films. It was a very natural progression to invite the viewer into the studio. Seven Fragments for Melius is a particularly delightful um, installation. It's an immersive environment where you can see on uh, nine screens and three different films that have been synced together. Uh, the, Kentridge at work, and he's using the most simple techniques to um, create magic in the studio. So he'll reverse animate. It looks like he's pulling papers out of thin air mm -hmm. while he's contemplating his drawings, when in actual fact he's throwing the drawings. But simply by reversing the film, um, it becomes all the more magical. The other thing that I think is one of the most delightful aspects of that film sequence in the um, Journey to the Moon is that he makes constellations appear. And you see these little moving, almost like star forms, white against a black background. And it might take you a minute or two, I'm, forgive me if I'm giving away the secret, but what he's done was he was actually photographing ants on a white studio table and reversing. And he laid down lines of sugar so that the ants create a very definite pattern. Um, you get a lot of ants in the summer in Johannesburg, 
um, after this, I heard from one of his studio assistants, they had a really hard time getting rid of the ants. Um, but uh, <laughs> the effect is absolutely magical. Yeah, and it was, um, I thought it was grains of rice when I first yeah. saw it that were being moved around. But then when I realized they were ants, I was like, wow, it's so interesting. How did he do that? I know, it's, it goes back to the sort of like, you know, the magic of a flea circus, you know, and <laughs> old fashioned, you know, um, tricks of the trade. And he's playing tribute and very specifically to George Melios. Um, and Melias now known to many people these days because of the book and then the film Hugo, mm -hmm. which celebrates the f absolute pioneer of film working in Paris um, in the first decades of the 20th century. Moving to the later part or the last few rooms of the exhibit where there's more sculpture, um, could you tell us more about that work and the Kaboom piece? So, one of the things that you'll discover as you go through the show is that Kentridge's practice is ever expanding. We've talked about the films, we talked about his involvement with theater, and of course the great drawings, but as you go through the show, you'll see that he's become a master of sculpture, uh, there are wonderful sculptural objects in the show. Uh, there's two fabulous tapestries on display. And I think most poignantly, the exhibition concludes with Kaboom, a video and related drawings uh, for a performance piece he called The Head and the Load. It is, I think, the most uncompromising gaze on the cost of colonialism in Africa. Um, it tells the story of the men who were pressed into service, conscripted during World War I, to restage the battles that you saw in Europe on African soil. Horses and oxen that would have traditionally carried armaments were considered too valuable. So men's lives hundreds of thousands of men's lives were lost playing out a war by foreign powers. And so I think what Kentridge tells us is to recognize our past so we can lead a more compassionate future. If we don't know our history, how can we move forward? One of the first works you see as you enter the show as a large tapestry of people bearing burdens across the background of the Antarctica. Kentridge knows, as we all do, that our climate is changing. It's going to force migrations. It's going to force us to change our lives. Kentridge is asking us to do that with wisdom and kindness. I think we should end there. Absolutely. A very powerful work. Um, such a beautiful exhibition. We really appreciate your time. And may I thank William Kentridge, the ideal partner in any endeavor, and Ed Shad at the Broad, who did a brilliant job assembling this show. Thank you. Find all of our videos and sign up for our newsletter at artthisweek.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter.